Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to rise today and speak to Bill C-4. As, uh, as a member who was elected to this House right off a job site and a proud member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, I'm very pleased to be speaking to this legislation. We've heard a lot in, in the debate about, uh, well, the, the Honourable Member was just talking about the executive and the membership. I can tell you I come from a union where the rank and file uh, were quite upset with Bill C-377 and Bill C-525. They wanted to see it go. They go to their monthly meeting. They discuss what kind of spending is going to happen at the executive level, right down to approving the credit card bill of the various uh, people who work in the office on a monthly basis. And I don't think there's any uh, doubt in the mind of most members at my union uh, that they have the opportunity not just to get the information about how their local union is spending money, but also to have a say in approving it on a regular monthly basis at open meetings. So um, I really do think that there's a, a fabricated um, uh, argument for transparency for those to whom, for those who need the transparency because it's their money, their dues money being spent, they have access to that information and have had access to that information. And in that sense, this bill really was uh, uh, a solution out looking for a, for, for a problem, Mr. Speaker. And I can tell you also that the executive in my union knows well that uh, the powers that they have when it comes to working with industry and going out and finding those jobs for members and making sure that members get a fair pay for the work that they do and that they get good benefits for the work they do don't come from any particular piece of legislation. Obviously, just like any other good institution, you need enabling legislation, and you certainly need to not have persecutive legislation, as I would say Bill C-377 and 525 were, but the power of the executive in my union comes from the membership. It comes from the good work that we go out and do every day. It comes from the quality product that we produce on site. It comes from the extra training that our union provides to our members so that we're out there being the best in the industry, Mr. Speaker. And that's why our contractors, when we've had issues, the electrical contractors of Manitoba have worked quite collaboratively with my local because they know that our union is providing value added to the projects that they do and frankly that we're making them more money. And that's what we hear in the dialogue with our contractors. So, I'm in a tight spot, Mr. Speaker, because of course I don't want to be unparliamentary. I don't want to attribute ulterior motives to any particular party. But the level of ignorance that you would have to attribute to people making some of the arguments that I've heard in the chamber today, uh, ignorance about the way unions work, about the relationship in the building trades between the unions and contractors, verges on unparliamentary. And so I'm just feeling in a bit of a tight spot. And of course I don't want to do any of that. So maybe what I'll talk about instead is the degree and extent to which this legislation has to be seen not just on its own, because if you consider it on its own, Mr. Mr. Speaker, then some of the red herrings that we've heard today may be effective. But when you consider it in the context of a government program, Mr. Speaker, that brought in Bill C-377, that brought in, that brought in Bill uh, C-525, that brought in Bill C-59, and then when railroad workers were going into negotiation with their employer, when Canada Post workers were going into negotiation with their employer, threatened, sometimes before they'd even have the, the strike vote, Mr. Speaker, to legislate those workers back to work. When you consider it in the context of a government, some of, whom's, some, some of whose members uh, were making comments, and we've heard it again today, Mr. Speaker, from those in the Conservative Party who are criticizing the RAND formula, who are criticizing mandatory union dues, when you consider it in the context, Mr. Speaker, of a government that limited access to EI so that workers had to be more afraid of challenging their employer because in the case of a layoff, they wouldn't be able to pay their mortgage and feed their families. When you consider it in the context of a government that refused to talk to provinces when they asked to talk to provinces to increase the Canada Pension Plan so that employers that were ready to retire couldn't leave the workforce, putting more downward pressure on wages and blocking opportunities for young workers to be promoted within their companies, when you consider it in that context, Mr. Speaker, not just the individual bills, I think it is impossible to say 
that those bills were not designed and meant as an anti-union program. And it had very little to do with anything that was coming from the rank and file of labor unions and everything to do with a government that was, that was working hand in hand with employers to put downward pressure on the working conditions and the wages of Canadian workers. And that's part of why these bills were so shameful, Mr. Speaker. It's not just for the content of the bills. We've heard a lot about what was wrong with the content of the bills, Mr. Speaker. But it's because they were part of a deliberate and sustained program to make life harder for Canadian workers so that corporations that were already over that time frame, Mr. Speaker, making record profits could add a little more to their margin. In a time when corporations were seeing their tax rate go from 28 percentage points to 15, uh, to a 15 percent, Mr. Speaker, they could squeeze a little bit more out of their workers. So when the economy is working well, I would say, Mr. Speaker, when we, it's, it's when we have labor peace, we have labor peace, not, not when employees are being held under the thumb of their employers, but when they're free to negotiate collectively with their employer and work for fair wages and fair benefits, we know that the union movement over time and today contributed to that, does contribute to that, and we know by the behavior of many employers, and I dare say even some governments, that if we did not continue to have a strong labor movement in Canada, Mr. Speaker, that we would soon lose those gains that were hard fought and hard won over the last 100 or 150 years. And that's why we're concerned on these benches to see, uh, to, to, to see a legislative environment uh, that allows the union movement to thrive. We hear sometimes that, oh, well, you know, times were tough and, uh, you know, we maybe needed some unions to help with workplace conditions, but by and large, really, prosperity just sort of spontaneously came out of the Industrial Revolution. But if, what's forgotten in that account, Mr. Speaker, is that the organization of workers went hand in hand with that. And it wasn't until workers were organized that those gains actually came, Mr. Speaker. So I think we need to be careful that we not uh, give credit for the accomplishments of the labor movement to employers that would still be, and we know that they would still be treating their workers in the way that they treated them in the 19th century, Mr. Speaker, because in parts of the world, the very same employers operating in Canada in some cases are treating their workers in other parts of the world as if it was the 19th century. So you'd have to be very naive to believe indeed, Mr. Speaker, that if there wasn't the legislative framework and if there wasn't the uh, strong labor movement that we've had in Canada here, that those same employers wouldn't get the idea that maybe they could treat their Canadian workers that way too. I think we need to be very careful that we not attribute the good conditions and the good wages that some Canadian workers continue to enjoy to the benevolence of their employer, but acknowledge that those were gains hard fought and hard won. And I would say that in their more enlightened moments, some employers, like some of the employers that I'm glad we have in the electrical industry in Manitoba, know that that has been overall good for them, that it's created a customer base, that having employees that have disposable income and can afford their home and aren't worried about their family and have childcare or, you know, I mean, we can get into all the issues, Mr. Speaker, but largely workers well-paid, well-fed, well-housed are more productive, and that's good for Canadian employers. And again, I think it speaks to the shame of the previous government that they would have sought unsolicited except maybe by some employers, I don't know who, but certainly not by a groundswell of Canadian workers to disrupt that partnership that had developed, not, al not always easy, uh, uh, but I think we had arrived at, at, a, at a place in Canada where at least some workers, and usually unionized workers, uh, were getting a fair return on, on, the, on the work they did and that employers were benefiting from having those productive workers. And uh, I don't think it's the place of a government to go and intentionally disrupt that. I think, as I said, you can talk about what's in the particular context of those bills. I don't think it's very good, but certainly when you look at the larger context, that seems to me to be the case. It's one of the reasons I ran, Mr. Speaker, because I didn't think we could tolerate having a government that was that bent on disrupting that relationship between the labor movement and employers and making sure that workers got their fair share and, uh, and it's why I'm, I, I, I can hardly wait, Mr. Speaker, to stand in favour of this bill. Thank you very much.